Uh, this is Andrew from Unaligned, and you're listening to the Broody Delicious Podcast. One, two, three, four. The Broody Delicious Podcast. The Broody Delicious Podcast. The Broody Delicious Podcast. The Broody Delicious Podcast. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me, man. Where are you guys located? Uh, two of the members are in Florida. Uh, one of the newest member, Shane, is actually in Arkansas. Oh. Arkansas. Right. right. <laughs> and where are you at? I live in Florida, West Palm Beach. Oh, okay. I used to live in St. Pete for quite a while. Oh, yeah, that's a nice area. <laughs> yeah. You guys are nice and warm down there. It's freezing up here in Richmond. Oh, we could use some of that, honestly. Uh, no, I can never get used to this crap. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about interdimensions. Oh. All right. I have been banging that song all day prepping for this thing. I'm a huge extreme metal fan. And I think the production is the thing that drew me in immediately. I mean, what you guys are doing is great, but the production is killer. Oh, yeah. How, how did that come about? Mike Lowe from um, the Artisan Era and In Fury. He's also in another big on Oubliette. I think it's what it's called. But he's he mixed us. Um, He's, I think he, I'm pretty sure that he's actually working with um, Dave Otero, which is a pretty big mixer. So mm-hmm. he's like his little, his protege, as far as I know. So we were recommended him actually through the drummer when we hired Jack for right. the album. He, he told us that, you know, he trusted Mike with mixing. So we, we, we gave it a shot. Damn. It's, it's big. It's powerful. It's, that's a great single. Oh yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> What's been the response to it so far? Honestly, it's, you know, it's been pretty, pretty, pretty good so far, you know, for a band that just came out of nowhere, you know, we didn't have anything previously before any of this. Mm-hmm. So the reception to it all has all just been really great. Honestly, I wasn't expecting it to go half as far as it's really. Going. Yeah, that's good. So with you guys being so far apart, how did you uh, write the the record? Did you take advantage of, you know, emailing things back and forth or were you able to get in the room the other way around? Uh, the, the, most of the music was written by the guitar player, Taylor. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he wrote it all in, in his room. I'll, you know, I actually, yeah, he wrote it in his room and I think he recorded it at his buddy's house. Um, but it was, he, he just recorded track guitar tracks, sent it to me. I just started writing lyrics to it. And then once we got far, far enough to, you know, think we had enough material for the album. Right. We sent it to, we, we contacted Jack and hired him and he delivered sick drums. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And after I heard the drums, that's when I laid my vocals on it. But the writing process pretty much, you know, Taylor's a machine. He, he's a riff, riff Lord. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like I said, that's been, uh, I've been doing interviews all day and, you know, doing the prep for him. This is the, uh, the heaviest and the best produce I've heard all day. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know Inner Dimensions is a concept album, but can you take us, well, not even just take us through, but is there something you want your listeners to walk away with after listening to the record? Like a takeaway? For me, for me, whatever. I mean, I, I tried to write it obviously as, you know, vague and interpretive as possible. But I want the listener to kind of interpret how they see it and, you know, kind of make what they feel out of it. But for me, writing it it's it's pretty much about overcoming you know like i think it's about how the exterior environment can affect your interior one and you know too much of all that toxicity can can ruin a person you know yes so from, especially over the last few years it's oh, up. Yeah. so it was for me is about is it, it was about overcoming you know it was a lot of obstacles trying to for myself kind of to to dig into the to the atmosphere of it because I don't know how to explain it really, but I, I just, I wanted it to be interpretive, I guess, you know, for the, for each listener, I wanted each person to find their own meaning out of it, you know? Right. So with that sort of thing, then you don't feel any sort of responsibility with your platform, putting, you know, your ideas out there or do you? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Like is, do you feel like you have to, gear some the listener towards a certain thing or are you pointing towards a certain thing or is it 
I guess you could say of gearing it towards yourself, you know, like the listener, I want the person to, to go into their own mind and see things, you know, for, for who they are. And And I think that, I I think it works because that's the whole gist of metal anyway, right? It's the individuality. I mean, it's still a community, but the individuality and do what you want and think for yourself and question. Exactly. That's yeah, pretty much the exact takeaway from that right there. Well, good. I mean, that, that's pretty much the uh, ethos of the whole metal community anyway, right? I mean, that's what it means to be a metalhead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that being said, though, like when you're writing songs, are you guys writing them for how they're going to come across in front of a live audience? Or are you writing a song for the song's sake, then adapting it? Uh, kind of uh, the... It's it's mainly about live for us because Taylor always writes all his riffs in a live format. You know, like anything he doesn't write anything that he can't translate live. And me, I just, I just, I can do. You know, me and him have experience working together in previous music, so it was a very natural, natural combination. Me and him together. So, um, yeah, it, you know, we, we definitely wrote it with the intentions to take it live, though. That's for sure. So it's pretty technical. Do you ever come across a situation where it's too difficult to take it live? There's too much shit going on when you recorded it or no? Uh, I think most of that's probably going to fall on the drummer, honestly. The drums are really extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Guitars, I, I, Taylor can nail it. I know I can nail my parts too. It's, it's the drummer, you know, the drums are the really the hardest part, I feel like, is, as far as taking live. Gotcha. So are you planning on taking this out on the road then? Oh yeah, that's definitely the goal. Right now, we're just trying to secure a, a, a lineup. Gotcha. We got almost all of it done, but okay. So then, yeah. So then, along the same lines, and are you going to be doing the releasing a single every six weeks, like the new music business model, or uh, right now, since the album, we actually have the whole album already out. Right, it came out um, in April, right? Yeah. April so, are, are you doing that single thing like every certain amount of weeks to keep it relevant, or? Uh. Right now we're working actually with a PR company. So that we're going to be launching maybe something like what you're saying soon, like next, next beginning of next year, we're going to launch another video. So we're going to try to punch out or push out some more content pretty much. Right. Cause I guess music business has changed so much. That's the, uh, that's the name of the game, right? You have to have new content constantly. Cause everybody's got the attention span of a fly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's rough. Does and, that make- Go ahead. And it's privacy too. <laughs> And, oh, very pricey. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different than, you know, the old days when you were trying to get, uh, when people bought the full record and you could actually make a, a decent amount of money rather than like a 17 cents Spotify stream. Exactly. Yeah, it's the business model of everything has changed so much. I kind of wish it was like how it was before, honestly, but. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, we talk about a lot on the show that the, those old days were great because you bought the whole record like uh actual tangible thing and then you know you spent your paper out money at on tuesday at the record store and then you brought the whole thing home and sat in front of it and read the lyrics and had the even the smell of the vinyl oh was a thing right there's there's nothing better in my opinion than having it in your hand and reading the lyrics you know they write artwork and everything that's the best part right who they thanked and i mean all that shit yep it's all the information that's in it you know like it's all it's all it's all part of the the, the, the feeling, you know, when you discover a new band and you, you feel like you're discovering the band too, you know? I know as a band, you have to straddle that fine line because of, of the way people consume music now. But as an old school fan, that's the, uh, you know, that's my heart. That's the way I like to look at things. Oh, same here. The internet kind of, it takes away from all that. I feel like the, you know, unless you're, unless you're doing it through the content format, like you're talking about, like it's, it's a tough business these days. <laughs> what is up, Delicious Faithful? Bruce Moore here to tell you about the Nothing Pacific, non-specific podcast. Ibrahim is a beginning stand-up comedian, and Marty teaches concealed carry and basic handgun safety in northern New Mexico. During the day, they worked together as trash men, and it was while they were out being garbage people that Marty thought a podcast was a good idea. Every week, they get together and discuss nothing specifically about anything worth anyone's time. They also don't really know what they're doing and ask you to listen to them talk about living and working in the war-torn hellscape Española, watching meth heads do karate in front of the bank, and how they can get rich quick. 
They ask for audience participation, like a crowdsourced project. And whether it's hate mail or advice on a subject they are very much unqualified to talk about or smart enough to have opinions of. So enjoy two morons expressing the hate of their jobs, science fiction, rocket-powered babies, and maybe even dead people. New episodes every Tuesday, barring any more mishaps of unprofessionalism or holiday laziness. So I encourage you to smash the link below and go check out the Nothing Pacific, non-specific podcast. And, I mean, obviously you have to evolve if you're going to even stay in front of people over Yep, exactly. on the internet so yeah i get it and it's tough because not only do you have to be a social i mean a, a musician and a producer and a mixer but then now you've got to be a social media expert oh yeah it's it's a whole it's a whole different ball game now <laughs> it's right. more than music. <laughs> oh yeah it's everything so now that um you know the record's been out whatever eight months or something you guys working on new stuff or you're always constantly writing or you just kind of yeah i mean taylor taylor's been hard at work honestly like he never stops um, we already actually have plans for our next album already set up like, it's, you know, material for a lot of it's already written. The themes, the titles, everything is already kind of there. Wow. We're just trying to hash it more out. Make sure, you know, we it took us actually a very short time to write Inner Dimensions, the whole album. Um, it only took us like four or five months to actually write the whole thing. Wow. And like, yeah, it's like I said, Taylor's a machine. <laughs> right. So he's already, you know balls deep in this next album already and it's already taking shape it's i'm i'm honestly super excited to get into that very soon <laughs> so it's coming up real quick when you guys are writing a new record is there any thought into not i know you can't really reinvent the wheel because you have a fan base but do you ever purposely try not to rewrite the same record oh yeah of course the next album is, is honestly completely different in a lot of ways i feel like it's um the first time was a little more progressive -y sounding, groove, groove oriented. The next one was very dark. It, it, we took, we, me and Taylor, were at, when we were writing it, we were in a very dark place because a lot of, you know, the last few years, you already know. Yeah, it's life, been, right. So, you know, it, it affected all of us in our own ways. And we decided to channel the energy into it, which kind of fits with the name and on the line. Like, we don't want to put out the same album every time, obviously, you know what I mean? So we channeled our energy a little differently into the next one. Right. And I imagine it was cathartic, right? Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> for the listener and for the, uh, I mean, that's the beauty of extreme music, I think, and heavy music, hard music is the catharsis from it, right? Exactly, yeah. As so, a musician and, you know, the listener, it's, it's I dare say, the same. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we want it to be, at least, you know. I feel. <laughs> do you ever feel like when you're writing, especially you as a lyric writer, do you ever feel that you're putting too much of yourself into the songs or being too vulnerable? Yeah, all the time, honestly. But I feel like at the same time, it's on the one hand, I feel like I'm exposing myself. And on the other hand, I feel like I'm not exposing enough, I guess. You know, like if I'm not exposing these sides of me, am I really exposing anything? I feel, you know, ever. My experience, am I really exposing myself, I guess? Right. So two parts of that. Ever question something that you put out after it's done? And, oh, oh yeah. And then what about, like, have you ever been to a point where you're like, now, nah, fuck, I can't put that on there? Uh, like I said, the, the process has been a little faster than, I, than I've anticipated, so I never really had the chance to be like, oh, shit, you know? I don't know, right. am I allowed to purse? Oh, yeah, I don't care. But yeah, yeah, I never really, like, by the time, by the time by the time things were actually I could have started to question things, it was already kind of like too late. <laughs> you know right. I mean? uh, well, so, I guess but I think that makes it more organic and more immediate and more real, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like I said, I was scared at first because you know, it was my debut as a vocalist for one thing. Right. Um I was scared all around when the album was starting to come out. Even like the singles were coming out. I was just always afraid someone was gonna rip apart my voice, rip apart my lyrics. You know, anything. <laughs> How so, much attention do you pay to the reviews? Uh, I'm not really the kind of one to turn away from criticism. I, I embrace it. You know, like I, I, that's the only way you're going to grow as a musician. I used to be afraid of it growing up. You know, I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, but now it's kind of like I want it. I want people to tell me what they what, what I want to improve on, you know. Right. And good and bad. They're exactly. Talking about you. And so far, I mean, I've you know, 
I've heard a couple of bad things, you know, or not bad things, but people that just weren't feeling, you know, what I was doing. And then on the other end, I've heard mo mostly people that have enjoyed it. So, you right. know, was, I think the people who connect with it are the ones most likely to reach out. The other ones are just keyboard warriors. Yeah, exactly. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> so with all that being said, then, how does it feel when something you've, especially from the lyrical point of view, when something you've written connects with a fan? It's like a magic, in my opinion, you know, like no better feeling than me feeling like what I'm saying is not being um, is not hitting people the right way. You know what I mean? Like I want I want people to feel that kind of way, you know, so that's the beauty of me exposing a lot of myself to it because right. people actually read it. Right. And it, it really just to me it paints a picture that people feel the same way as me. I guess, you know, I'm not right. alone. Right. And I, going back to the whole metal community, I think that's the whole, the whole community, right? No one's ever alone. There's this weird unspoken connection, metal connection. If that makes any sense, it's different from any other genre, right? I, I agree. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm in it. <laughs> yeah. But you could like from you know, whatever location you're in, in Florida, you could move over to uh, Germany and you've got some in common with, Oh yeah, people, and you kind of just bond like your family. That's the thing about metal; it's universal, in my opinion. Like every country has, uh, you know, even the ones that try to fight against it. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. So, um, other than that, where can fans find you? You know, if people are looking for you. Um, honestly, I think we're everywhere at this point. Like as far as services go, streaming services. Um, there's so many of them now; I can't keep track. So, I know, and uploading the the distribution is like it's where they have an endless list now and it just keeps growing yeah of services and, and i teach one is for a different country it's like just like obviously in america you know spotify and itunes are the right Pandora are the main ones here and other ones are like deaver or something like that or i don't know there's like ones i've never even heard of and i'm constantly hearing new ones too right you got to be a total social media expert as well as a musician and a writer and a producer and all the other junk marketing yeah yep so before we go, I have a uh, quick little game, if you don't mind. They, sure. make, they make for great shorts. So in a All second right. here, I'm going to show you a picture. And I need you to tell me what's happening in the picture and what's going to happen next. Okay. It could be as simple as two sentences if you want. Let me just pull it up and you should see it now. Looks like a guy's eating some Doritos. He's going Super Saiyan. You know, and eating his hair. <laughs> now, it's funny you said Doritos. I've been using every every time we record, we have a, a theme going on. So today it's this picture, but we use the same picture through all dozen interviews that we do through the day. And you're the second person who said Doritos and somebody else said Cheetos. I don't see that at all. I'm looking at flames. It's a little pixelated on my end, but. What do you think is in his book? What's in his book? I don't even know. Any a bookmark? Uh, I book. guess. So what do you uh what is the next frame? Uh the next frame? Cheetos all over his face. I don't even see another frame yet. No, no, no. Hypothetically, what's the next frame? Oh, he's dude's gonna throw all them Cheetos in the air, man. <laughs> all right, well that's it. I hope I didn't bother you with that, but these little shorts sometimes do really well. I enjoyed it. It was cool. Thank you, my friend. I love that song, truly. That's a banger. Hey, thank you, man. I can't wait to hear more. Dude, me too. I can't wait to show y'all more. <laughs> awesome. You have a great day. You too, buddy. Thanks for doing it. Bye. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effing Perspective don't have to wonder because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. <laughs>